So I wanted to do something today. Um, I just want to read through Genesis 1, which is an absolutely magnificent chapter of Scripture, and I just want to discuss it a little bit. And uh, I hope this will be interesting to you. Maybe you'll see some things that you hadn't seen here before. Um, this is an absolutely devastating passage uh, that debunked, uh, for example, Darwin's theory of evolution before it um, ever was even conceived, and, uh, and flies in the face of Big Bang cosmology, which is the religious system that is being pushed on the world today, and taught in schools, and uh, embraced by the modern so-called scientific establishment. Without further ado, I'm just going to read this, and you can read along with me, and then I'll discuss some points from this chapter. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. 
And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the field, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. What an absolutely stunning and majestic account we have here. So let's go through this and break this down. Um, you know, Big Bang Cosmology says that uh, everything was created in an explosion, and it was a big accident, and there's no purpose to anything, and uh, no intelligence behind it, certainly no God, um, in instigating or guiding creation, that it was all accidental, and that this ex explosion created time, space, matter, and energy. But really, it's, uh, it's nonsensical. How can something come from nothing? Uh, how can nothing create everything? And how can things create themselves and shape themselves and guide themselves? It's nonsensical. Uh, everything that we see in the scriptures is the opposite of Big Bang cosmology. If you have been taught that your life is purposeless and has no meaning, Understand that the Bible teaches the exact opposite of that, that uh, humanity was created in God's image and we do have purpose. Uh, we do have meaning. There is a reason for us to be here. And we see uh, glimpses of that purpose starting right here in the very beginning of the scriptures. But here in the Bible, it says, uh, in the beginning, um, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, so we have time, space, matter, and then in uh, verse 3, and God said, let there be light, energy. We have God creating time, space, matter, and energy here in the first few verses of this passage. And uh, another thing that's interesting, and we'll see this uh, here at the beginning, but then also at the end of the passage, um, we do see various elements uh, or uh, characteristics of God being um, laid out here. Firstly, he has a plan and a purpose. He's doing doing this creation in a logical way uh, in increments. He's building up to a climax, um, which is ultimately the pinnacle of the material creation, humanity made in God's image. And uh, we see some things about God that uh, the Spirit is there. But then we'll see later on a plurality at the end of this passage. Um, let us make man in our image. That is a reflection of the reality that God is a trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which other scriptures, including John 1, are clear that all three persons of the Godhead were present and active in creation. Um, God is love. And... A singular entity having only self-love, that is kind of a, a disturbing thing, but understand that God is a trinity, three persons in one, and the members of the trinity pre-existed all things, and they had love one for each other before anything else existed. Here in verse 2, we see that the earth was without form and void, Empty darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So understand what's what's there at this point is a surface of water, the great deep. And we really have no idea how far it extends, perhaps infinitely, in all directions, don't know. Um, and what we'll see throughout this creation process is, I've mentioned this in my video on biblical cosmology. God is starting at the surface of the great deep, and he's building outward and upward from there. So we're at the basement of the universe level, the surface of water, this horizontal face of waters. And then God is going to build outward and upwards from that point. 
Um, let there be light, and there was light. Understand, too, that this creation uh, process and the order of operations that God undertook here, it is different from what uh, the B Big Bang cosmology teaches, that there's this explosion um, that threw matter outwards in all directions, that that matter coalesced and sort of condensed under the magical force of gravity to create, collapsing in on itself to create stars, and, um, well, black holes forming, you know, the centers of galaxies, and then eventually stars formed from the accretion disks, matter collapsing in on itself, and then eventually igniting, and then those stars pulling in more matter, and then those co coalescing to form planets. Um, the order of operations is different here in the scriptures. It doesn't quite match up. For example, the creation of light and darkness pre-exists the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. And the division between light, or day, and the darkness, night, um, that pre-exists that light sort of being focused into the, uh, the luminaries, the sun, moon, and stars that we have today. And um, one thing we see f for the first time here in verse 5, the evening and the morning were the first day. Understand that uh, the reason for a creation week, God creating things over the course of six days and resting on the seventh, is that God is laying out a pattern for humanity and how we are to live. And we still have the seven-day week today. Now, there have been cultures um, that have changed up the week here and there, but... Uh, the seven-day week is still with us here now, thousands of years after the moment of creation. And things have changed a little bit in the modern era. We now have a weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, where we have generally two days of rest, although, you know, it varies from industry to industry. Um, there are still plenty of jobs, and uh, the one I'll be working here will be six days a week. Plenty of jobs where, you know, you got to work six and... There's one day of rest, like the, the biblical pattern. But uh, as humanity has become weaker and more genetic defects and stuff, we do need to rest more. Um, and that's why we now have a two-day weekend, um, among other reasons. But uh, here we have God establishing a pattern. And it's very clear that we are talking about literal 24-hour periods of day and night. The evening and the morning were the first day. There's nothing here about this language that leaves any room for interpretation about vast eons of time. You have to twist the scriptures to get to that conclusion. So these aren't ages, uh, or thousands of years, or millions of years. These are literal 24-hour days. And why is that? Well, God certainly could have called everything forth in an instant, and literally gone from nothingness to everything in a split moment of time, but he's doing this because he's laying out a pattern for humanity. And if he's laying out a pattern for humanity, well, we live, our days are 24 hours. Why would he create a pattern that was vastly different than that? No, it's pretty clear from the language here and from the purpose behind it that these are literal 24-hour days. So if you are, you know, adhering to the spirit of the scriptures as they're presented to us, you will be a young earth creationist. Uh, it's That worldview is just built into the scriptures. That is the interpretation that God lays out for us. Now you can try to shoehorn something else in there and adhere to a different understanding of things, but you're then leaning on a private interpretation of scriptures that's inconsistent with what God has actually given us. All right, Genesis 1, 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So God is creating some kind of division between waters above and waters below. Verse 7, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So really, I see this as a bubble. God's creating a bubble. Now what is this firmament? Well, uh, let me just tell you what the traditional Hebrew understanding of this was. We have Josephus, a uh, Jewish historian who eventually 
um, earned his Roman citizenship and was thus re uh, renowned and respected in both the Jewish uh, community and in the secular Gentile world. And he's one of antiquity's greatest historians. And he writes in his Antiquities of the Jews, which follows the biblical account of history, um, he writes that the, uh, the firmament is a crystalline structure. Most likely dome-like. And um, and so we have this bubble that God has created, separating waters above from waters underneath. And uh, what are the waters underneath? Well, I do believe that that is the surface of the great deep, which the land masses of the earth stand out from. But then you could also make the argument that our atmosphere is kind of an extension of that. Uh, technically, gases are a fluid medium as well. But then we know that there's waters above the firmament, uh, during the flood, the windows of heaven, the apertures in the firmament, were opened, and God used that to flood the earth. Um, but let's carry on. We'll see more about the firmament in a moment here as we go forward. So, God calls the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Understand something in the biblical cosmology, there are three heavens. Uh, back when I, now I was, I was raised as a heliocentrist, my parents were as well, we have since shifted our perspective on things, having studied the scriptures and become more aware of a, a, the original understanding of them, which is a flat earth biblical cosmology. And so I now consider myself to be a Bible-believing flat earther, um, and, uh, and that just fits with the scriptures, uh, literally dozens, if not hundreds, of passages that make it clear that we don't live on a spinning space ball in a heliocentric model. But, uh, so there are three heavens in the scriptures. We see references to the third heaven in the New Testament. Um, Paul talking about a man caught up to the third heaven. And uh, so, what are the heavens? Well, one of them is this, the firmament. And uh, so the firmament can refer to both the structure itself, this dome-like structure that separates waters above from waters below, but it can also refer to the uh, expanse underneath that solid firmament. And that's what we've got here. God called the firmament heaven. So that is the first heaven. The heaven of the firmament. We're going to see this again as we go forward when God creates uh, the sun and the moon and where he places them. And then the other heavens. Um, well, uh, back when I was a heliocentrist, I was taught that uh, the heavens are um, the atmosphere, outer space, and then God's paradise. Now, as a Bible-believing cosmologist, I believe, um, and I might be incorrect about this, but I believe that the heavens are the atmosphere underneath the firmament structure, uh, the angelic realm, and then God's paradise. I do not hold that... Uh, I don't think outer space exists as we are told it does under the heliocentric religious philosophical system. All right, well, let's carry on. Uh, so Genesis 1, 9, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas and God saw that it was good. So this is very clear. Let the waters under the heaven. So we're still in context talking about the firmament heaven or the atmosphere, this, uh, this expanse that God has created using the firmament structure. And it's the waters under the heaven that are gathered together to one place and which, you know, become the dry land. They coalesce to be uh, dry land. So let me ask you the question. Um, and then we see here God called the dry land earth. So th this is specifically dry land under the firmament and dry land is earth. Earth is dry land. So let me ask you a question. Are planets terrestrial? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think, given the definition of Earth as dry land and it being under the firmament structure, I don't think there's room for terrestrial planets. 
in a biblical cosmology. I do not. I don't see any evidence that the planets are anything other than luminaries in a biblical cosmology. And the gathering together of the water is called He Sees. And then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. This is a first reference to after his kind. And understand here that God is not a fool. Um, the whole question, why reproduce, is a huge issue. It is a huge problem for Big Bang cosmologists who believe in uh, that life developed you know, uh, along Darwinian lines, evolution, biological evolution, via whatever mechanism. Because even if life could arise from non-living materials through purely natural processes without God, and that's an impossibility, let's just be straight about that, even if that could happen, why reproduce? Because as soon as life goes to reproduce, it's creating competition for itself. Parent generations creating competition for, the, for themselves with their children generations uh, for resources. Understand that um, reproduction is very dangerous to the parent generation. Uh, you know, the female in, in particular having to carry around her young inside of her or lay and protect eggs. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Um, what in the world could have caused animals to evolve to reproduce? Um, what in the world could have caused genders to evolve in parallel and still be able to work together and be functional? You start to understand that even if evolution could happen, by itself, there still needed to be some guiding intelligence behind it to coordinate it and make it all work. There's just too much random chance involved there. It could never happen. But the Bible says very specifically in this passage that not only did God create life, he created it with the potential in itself, whose seed was in itself, with the potential for reproduction. God loves life. And he intends for living things to propagate and to reproduce and to fill the earth. And we'll see that moving forward. So not only is God, you know, there's that, that ancient chicken and egg uh, debate. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, well, the Bible's pretty clear that it was the chicken. But with the inbuilt potential to create eggs from the get-go. Um, we see God creating complete adult organisms, uh, whether they be plants or animals or humanity, complete adult organisms with the potential to reproduce. And that brings us to another thing, too, that, uh, that at the end of that creation week, there was an appearance of age to the creation. Why? Well, because God's creating completed organisms. He's creating Adam, complete, mature. We don't know exactly what that means. Was he a late teenager, approximately looking guy? Would he be, you know, 25-ish? Uh, we don't know, but he was a man. He wasn't a boy. So he was an adult, mature organism, capable of thinking and reasoning and communicating. He was a person. Um, and he had an appearance of age, even though at the end of that first creation week... Uh, well, he was created at the end of day six, so at the end of the seventh day, he would have been, you know, a, a little more than a day old. So that would have been his actual age, but he would have had the appearance of age of being older. And that's really important. Um, appearances can be deceiving. Now, you might ask the question, does that mean that God is deceptive or tricky? No, of course not. We have here scripture. This is God's word, and he's telling us exactly what he did. full disclosure that uh, the creation process took a week. So no, God's not being deceptive at all if we choose to believe him. And the uh, this omniscient perspective on the creation that we're given here in Genesis, understand that no human being was around to observe this. After his kind is an important phrase that we'll see again here in Genesis, and that does mean that the different uh, types of animals are distinct from each other. Humanity was created in God's image, 
humans have always been humans. We did not evolve from lower animals. The, uh, the Big Bang cosmology of our time wants you to believe that you're an animal. Why? Because that means you have no purpose except to seek pleasure. And, uh, and if you are a hedonist, pleasure-seeking, and that's your only purpose in life, your only goal, you are easily manipulated. You, uh, despite being created in God's image for higher purposes, if you're a hedonist, you have lowered yourself to living like an animal, and you're missing out on your purpose. And that's a terrible thing. But that makes it easy to exploit you and to control you and to manipulate you. And uh, that reduces you to the level of cattle so that you can be ruled over by wicked oligarchs who run this world system. And that's why these things, Big Bang cosmology, uh, evolution, life rising from non-living materials without God, that's why all these things are taught in high, so-called higher education um, institutions in the West. It's... Uh, it's actually to dumb people down and to brainwash them into thinking that their lives don't matter and make them easy to dominate and control by wicked people and wicked spiritual forces. Let's carry on. The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit in whose seed was in itself after his kind. God saw that it was good. And then God creates the luminaries, the lights. Uh, verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and for years. So understand here that God is not only saying that he created these things, he's not only telling us where he put them, but he is telling us their purpose. Signs, seasons, days, years. These are not a habitation for humanity. These are not terrestrial, remember, Biblical definition of earth is that it's the dry land under the firmament. So these lights in the sky, these are not places that we can go and live. That's not what they were created for. They're created to be signs, seasons, days, and years. The sun and the moon, elsewhere in the scripture, we see that they make their circuits over the earth, over the face of the earth. And then we see that the luminaries seem to make their circuits around the sun and the moon. Or, uh, the sun, rather. And um, the sun actually is moving in and out as it makes its circuits between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, so that its motion pattern, if you were to actually draw, draw it out, looks like kind of a spirograph-looking design. And then understand, as it's moving, the, uh, the planets, or that literally that word literally means wandering stars, those luminaries are traveling around the sun, and so their motion over the surface of the Earth also looks like a spirograph pattern. It is incredibly orderly. It is incredibly predictable, like a clock. Um, it's incredibly magnificent and beautiful. And the purpose of these things is signs, seasons, days, years. So the moon is there to tell you the moons or the months. The sun is there to denote the days, to divide day from night. Moon's purpose is also to um, uh, light the night, as we see here. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, the stars and the planets, the ancients used these to demark certain events, to use to record, you know, certain ages and uh, the years and so forth. That's the purpose of these things, signs, seasons, and days, and years. And signs is very interesting. Uh, let me just say this. Um, there's astronomy and there's astrology. And uh, I don't know with exact certainty where the boundary lies between those things. Once we start getting to the extreme end of astrology where you start believing that the heavenly bodies govern every detail and aspect of human life, so that if you're born under a certain star or planet, you're going to have a certain personality and all the events of your life are going to be charted out. No, that's superstition. We're getting off the deep end there into some weird stuff. Um, 
But then on the other hand, we do see in scriptures that, uh, um, for example, the, the wise men who came to visit Christ, they knew that a monumental spiritual event had happened from observing the skies, and they saw his star, Jesus' star, in the east, and they knew that something important was going on. So, yes, uh, these were created for signs to broadcast that momentous events are coming or have occurred. And um, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know exactly where the boundaries lie. So most cultures, ancient cultures, have a form of the zodiac, and I don't think the zodiac is an evil thing. I think it's actually a mnemonic device that these cultures used to tell the constellations and used for timekeeping purposes. Um, I think, though, that religious systems have taken over the zodiacs and kind of spiritualized them and mystif uh, added some mysticism and some other, uh, you know, mystery religion aspects to them uh, that have corrupted them in some ways. But I think initially they were just devices used to teach children the constellations and the stars to be able to navigate by those, to be able to tell the seasons and things like that by those. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really know the exact boundary between astronomy and astrology. It's hard hard to know. I mean, I can tell uh, when people are getting on the fringe of it and they're starting to say, you know, that the planets govern all human events. I don't, I don't believe that. I think there's still some free will there because we're created in God's image. So I don't go off that deep end. I don't use the horoscope or my my sign to to determine like who I'm going to date and uh, life decisions and things like that. I know that there are groups and religions and secret societies that do that, um, but that's a, a degree that where I think things are being taken too far. The Bible does condemn those who worship the sun, moon, and stars because they are not God; they are God's creations. Now, what does God do with these? Uh, he sets these luminaries. Uh, well, firstly, let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And he made two great lights, the greater to rule the day, the lesser to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven. So there's a couple different ways we could look at this. In the ancient view, the stele fixe, or the fixed stars, were studded into the eighth celestial sphere which was that firmament structure, crystalline structure. And then that was the eighth celestial sphere. There were lesser spheres within it, which were the, uh, the circuits made by um, the other luminaries, whether those be the sun and the moon or the planets. And those were not physical spheres. Those were just sort of shells of orbit uh, or the circuits of the other luminaries. But in the ancient view, the stellae fixae were fixed into the firmament itself, whereas the sun and moon are freely moving and making circuits within the, uh, the earth realm, or within the firmament of the heaven. And uh, I do, for the time being, I adhere to that particular model or understanding of things. It makes sense to me. And uh, without further information, I can't really make any further judgments on that. But understand that this phrase, in the firmament of the heaven, yes, that could be within the enclosure, so in the atmosphere, that'd be our sun and moon moving there, or it could be in the firmament of the heaven as in studded into the actual solid crystalline firmament structure as the ancients believed the stars were. Um, so I do think that this fits with some of those ancient flat earth uh, views or ancient cosmologies of how things were. And uh, the sun and the moon, they're both lights. Um, the moon is not a reflector of the sun's light. And we and that's pretty obvious that the moon's um, wavelengths of light that it's putting off and the effects that it has are different from the, the sun. The sun has a rejuvenating, life-giving quality, a golden light, whereas the moon has a very beautiful uh, silver light that causes disturbances, uh, you know, um, and words like lunatic or lunacy um, have ties to the moon. And, uh, you know, I know for a fact that the depression I've struggled with my whole life is tied to the moon's phases in some respects. And usually there's about 
four days every month where, well, I guess every month, um, I'm not an expert on moon phases and things like that, but there's about four days periodically every so often that I just can't sleep often. And sometimes I'll be entirely sleepless for that period um, or struggle with sleep uh, and things like that. Um, the sun and the moon, they are, the moon is not a mere reflector of the sun. It just isn't. It is a light of its own. And elsewhere in scripture, we see that, that the moon has her own light. The moon will be turned one day to blood, and the sun will be darkened. So if the sun's darkened, how is the moon still giving off light? Because she is a light source of her own. She's not reflecting the sun's light. She has uh, a different light of her own that is a different quality of light than the sunlight. The sunlight, is, by the way, is antiseptic, whereas the moon's light is septic. And uh, laundry... I, I was just picking up on this. In the ancient world, people, and you know, in our in our past, people would wash their clothing and then they would let it dry in the sun. And there's a reason for that. The sunlight actually is killing microorganisms that are in the clothing and the bedding and things like that. Uh, it has that antiseptic, uh, antibacterial aspect to it. And so people would naturally use it for cleaning their clothes and so forth. All right, well, let's carry on. And God said, verse 20, Let the waters bring forth abundantly in the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So this is what I meant when I said uh, the firmament both refers to the open enclosure, but it also uh, refers to the solid structure, the dome-like structure, and then the enclosure formed underneath it, which is our atmosphere. And the fowl are flying. Um, above the earth, but in that open firmament or an enclosure of heaven, or expanse of heaven, I guess you could call it. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. So the Bible elsewhere does say that God created all things for his pleasure. What is the purpose of the animal kingdom? Well, their main directive here in Genesis 1 that God gave them, uh, well, all things were created for God's pleasure, so that is one purpose of all things, including humanity and animals. But uh, one of their purposes that he gave them was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and fowls to fill the earth. Uh, God loves life. He loves variety, and he built all the genetic variation into things at the very beginning. And um, with uh, the possibility of probably near-infinite variety, if we're being honest about it. And, um, you know, incredible biodiversity. And I think that while we have the same kinds of life today that were created at creation. I suspect that humanity looks very different today than they did back then. Um, people back in the day were probably larger and stronger, and they definitely lived longer, and they were more genetically pure. Understand that over time, in a biblical view, so in an evolutionary view, um, there's all manner of proposed mechanisms for where genetic diversity comes from, mutations, yada yada, borrowing from other organisms, you name it. Um, but in a biblical cosmology, God created everything with the genetic variation in it already. And so what has happened over time is actually that we've lost genetic information. Um, due to the curse, due to di different um, species dying out and becoming extinct, due to different branches of humanity, for example, dying off and their genes being lost. Um, so we've actually lost genetic diversity. And same thing uh, in the animal kingdom. Um, so there's uh, an entropy, a decay, a loss of information, a breakdown of order. This is what the Bible teaches, and it's consistent with laws of nature and laws of entropy. Uh, however, evolution contradicts laws of entropy, which says that things tend towards chaos, disorder, and decay. Uh, the idea that things built themselves up over time, that more genetic information slowly you know, developed and developed, that goes against science. 
uh, the knowledge that we have from science and our understanding of natural laws. Uh, which is why when you really start getting into it, Big Bang cosmology, evolution, uh, it's a religious system. And so we say that people today are secular, but they worship science. They've taken science and sometimes government, and they've made these into their gods. They've made these into their churches. And uh, high priests of scientism and authoritarian government are their religious leaders for people like this. It's very sad to see because it is it is delusional and it's actually anti-scientific and, of course, anti-scriptural. But um, really, if you break it down, the purpose of the animals is to reproduce. That is the highest purpose that we see for them in, uh, in the scriptures. Well, we do see later on that humanity is given dominion over over nature and over the animals. And so you can argue, I guess, that uh, that the role of animals is also to serve humanity and to bring us pleasure and companionship and, you know, uh, help us out in labor, you know, like horses plowing fields and things like that. Um, so you could argue that as well, that that would be a purpose, um, a sort of corollary purpose based on the purpose of um, that was given to human humanity. But notice that the beasts, they all reproduce after their kind, cattle after their kind, creeping things after their kind. Uh, there's no crossover. There's different kinds uh, of creatures, and they reproduce after their kind. Cats produce cats. Dogs produce dogs. Uh, different types of birds produce the same type of bird. Um, there's no crossover between the kinds. This is something, again, that goes against Big Bang cosmology, which says that all life had to have evolved from a single source and branched out from there. Why, why are they so dogmatic about that? As I mentioned before, because they want you to believe that you're just an animal. That is really the main thing they're trying to sell you, and that you have no purpose, ultimately. That is a lie. Scripture lays out the reality of it. Let's carry on. Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. Created he him, male and female. Created he them. So there's many things that we see here. Firstly, God does identify as masculine. Let's just be very clear about that. God is not a she. Um, you're getting the idea that God is a woman from these pagan religions. And that contradicts what the Bible lays out. Uh, Jesus Christ was a man. God the Father is God the Father, not God the Mother. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus actually describes as a he as well. All three persons of the Godhead are masculine. And um, there's a reason for that. Um, and then there's a reason why humanity was broken down into male and female. Several different reasons. Uh, reproduction being one of them that's laid out here. Uh, God blessed them and told them to be fruitful, multiply, and fill or replenish the earth and subdue it. Uh, you know, you got to reproduce to do that. And male and female were how God laid it out for humanity to reproduce. Um, but then male and female, the Bible actually says that this is a great mystery that the Bible discloses for us. That male and female are specifically designed to represent the relationship between God, Christ, and his church. The church is the bride of Christ. And uh, so God is masculine and the church is feminine. And the reason for this is they are they have this, this bond, this relationship, and the marriage is to mimic that, where uh, the spiritual authority in the marriage does fall on the man. But he is not to lord it over and be abusive of his bride. He is to teach her, to lead her compassionately and with love, and to be self-sacrificial in his love and care for her. And this is a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. Remember that Christ died and sacrificed himself 
to save us from our sins. And, uh, and so there's many purposes here built into male and female. But understand that this male and female, that is a creation of God. That is something that God specifically did. Um, there are many purposes there built into that. But uh, the transgender agenda is wicked. Homosexuality is wicked. These are rebellion against nature and against the purposes of God. If you want to uh, find your purpose, understand that it's not you're not going to find it in the homosexual lifestyle, and you're not going to find it in rebelling against nature and mutilating your body and trying to change your gender. It is not to be found in those things. If you want to find your highest purpose, um, it is in bringing honor and pleasure to your Creator and knowing Him and loving Him and serving Him and having a relationship with Him. In Genesis, we see that Adam and Eve had a close relationship with God who actually walked with them and taught them many things. And uh, after they sinned because they were given free will being made in God's image to either serve God and love him or to reject him and go their own way and they made the wrong decision there which cast all of creation because humanity was the pinnacle of creation all of creation uh, was then put under the curse and now is in a state of decay and groans and travails under the crushing and horrific burden of sin and death and that is humanity's greatest problem today. And there's only one solution for that. Um, the Bible says without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Uh, death is a consequence of sin. We need someone to take care of that sin problem for us, and it's not a problem that we can overcome on our own. Sin and death are insurmountable problems for us. But Christ destroyed those enemies for us by sacrificing himself and taking upon himself the penalty for our sins. And that's what the Bible's all about. The God who created all things perfect and had a perfect relationship with Adam and Eve at the beginning, uh, after things fell, he didn't abandon us. He still wants to have a relationship with his creation. God is a person. And that's part of us being created in God's image. We are people because God's also a person. He's not an impersonal force. He wants to get to know us. He wants to have input in our lives. And he wants to restore that proper relationship and balance that once existed. Uh, God is working to reconcile all things to himself, the Bible teaches. And if you want to understand more about Jesus Christ, he was God in the flesh, sent here to point us to the Father. Um, I would recommend that you start reading the Gospel of John. It's going to lay out some deep mysteries of our reality for you. Um, but I don't want to get out of the context here of Genesis 1 too far. I don't want this video to be too long. Lord willing, as I have time, opportunity, and the leading, uh, I'll go through some other chapters in the Bible here and there, as, as, uh, as the Lord permits and directs. But... Um, Let's see again what the purposes here in Genesis were for humanity. Uh, God blessed them, verse 28, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Okay, so there is, like I said, God loves life. He wants humanity to flourish and to fill this earth. And uh, But then there's also the dominion aspect. Subdue it, the earth. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We are given dominion and stewardship over nature because we are the pinnacle of God's creation. Now there is responsibility that comes with that. And I will say this, humanity exercises that dominion, but we typically have not done it responsibly. Um, we overhunt and overfish things to extinction. We pollute our land. We destroy entire habitats. Now not... now. You know, this earth was given to us as a resource for us to use. And there's an appropriate way to do that. And uh, But then humanity typically does that to extremes and doesn't manage it well, sadly. 
And uh, we would do a lot better if we understood and applied the principles that God lays out in his word for that dominion and for that stewardship. But as the world gets more and more secular and distant from God, we tend to get worse and worse in how we manage the resources that we've been given. But these are just some of the purposes of humanity. There are others laid out elsewhere in the scriptures. Uh, this does fly in the face of the worldview of our time, of the corrupt so-called elites, the oligarchs who rule over us, who have a Malthusian fallacy uh, uh, worldview. We call this the Malthusian fallacy. Thomas Malthus was an economist who believed that population growth would be exponential while the growth of resources would be linear, ultimately leading to a time when there was not enough food to feed everyone and things would be really bad. And so those who rule over us want to trim down Earth's population to 500 million and keep it at that point or below. And that's a satanic worldview, an anti-God perspective. Understand this Earth realm, if managed properly, could sustain 60 to 80 billion people. We don't have a, a, a resource issue. We have a management issue. God told us to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the Earth, and he didn't put any limits on that. And God's not a fool. This earth realm is abundant. Managed properly, um, it can sustain tens of billions, far more than the population that exists right now. And understand that Malthus got it wrong because he lived at a time when uh, technology wasn't multiplying the productivity of a, an acre of land like it does today, where you know the yields are 80 times what they would have been in Malthus day when they were plowing with animals and you know didn't know about fertilizers and GMO foods and all this other stuff and uh, crop rotation things like that and then they didn't have mechanized farming back then either and then you got to understand that as the population grows and there's more people to produce food as well the food supply can grow with the population uh, land can be reclaimed and irrigated from deserts and wastelands and planted and, uh, and so forth and cultivated. Um, so that's why we call it the Malthusian fallacy because the, the philosophy of Thomas Malthus was incorrect. There were factors involved there that he just didn't see. It's an outdated view. Uh, the Bible lays things out that God loves life and wants humanity to be fruitful and multiply. And the best thing that you can do as someone who is resisting the corrupt power structures of this world is to have a huge family, educate them yourself, raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord using the scriptures as the basis for their education, and teach them to live well and to be food independent, self-sufficient, to actually learn skills that are valuable like growing a garden um, you know raising animals and things like that how to build things with your hands things that are worthwhile get back to living a, a more simple and wholesome lifestyle closer to nature and more natural and then um, you know the legacy that you're going to leave behind the most important legacy is your kids and so if you're neglecting your kids for the sake of your career so that you can make money that's dumb. Uh, you're not going to live forever, and what's going to happen once you're dead and gone? That money goes to someone else. Your kids are your legacy. Make sure you're investing in them, if you have any. Um, and that is the most important legacy that you could have. Most people, their children will, will be the greatest impact that they will have on the world. So make sure you're raising your children according to the correct principles. And then originally everyone was vegan, or well, vegetarian anyways. They didn't eat flesh. So meat today, we use the word meat to just mean flesh, generally speaking, in, a, in a, you know modern English. But meat just means sustenance in the uh, King James English. And so you could have flesh for meat, but in, in the case, everyone started off you know eating uh fruit of trees and things like that, and herbs. These things were meat or sustenance for them. Now we live in an era where God has specifically allowed us to eat animals now and live a living, you know, non-plant 
stuff. And the Bible specifically says that that is completely acceptable to do that. And I love a good steak. And I will continue eating steak, uh, you know, as I have the opportunity to be able to afford it and get it when I need it. And so forth. Uh, and we call meat meat now. Or I, I should say we call flesh meat now. Flesh and ve vegetable material both are now acceptable meats for humanity in the modern era. And God does sign off on that, on the consumption of uh, flesh in the scriptures, elsewhere in the scriptures. But originally, everything was perfect. There was no death, uh, or I should say there was no death of animals um, and man. Uh, I'm not sure that in the biblical cosmology, the death of plants is seen as real death um, in the eyes of God obviously there would have been cellular death of these plants as they're being eaten for food. Plants are, you know, living things, but they have a different level of life than animals or human beings do in the biblical cosmology. But in conclusion, Genesis 131, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And once again, we see in the evening and the morning where the sixth day uh, another literal 24-hour period of creation in which God created the land, animals, and man. An absolutely staggering and magnificent record of how this earth realm and humanity came to be. And uh, a very clear, um, clearly delineated description of some of the purposes of humanity, and uh, there's a lot packed into this passage. It's absolutely magnificent, well worth uh, a read, well worth studying. I hope this has been interesting, and uh, I hope this gets you curious about the rest of the scriptures if you're not in the habit of studying them, or if you're not a, a Bible-believing Christian, that uh, you would think about these things a little bit, and that they would make you seek out more truth. As I mentioned, the book of John is very, it's an important read if you're, if you don't understand who Jesus was, the cent central figure of human history. Uh, who he was, what he came to do, and uh, the book of John is, uh, tells you what that is. And uh, anyway, I hope this has been an interesting video, and uh, have a good day.